Lair Accordia August of Foyle Road. Welcome to my story with me, Mary Honan, on Lear Media, supporting the Samaritans, Limerick and Tipperary, Clare's Wish Foundation in Limerick and Deal Animal Rescue in West Limerick. Now, my extraordinary guest today is a lady I've been trying to get for a long, long time, and she's Dame Helen Hyde. And she studied in Witwaterstrand University, South Africa, King's College, London, Yad Vashem in uh, Israel, and the Center for Holocaust Studies at the Institute of Education, London. She was a school teacher, a head teacher at Watford Grammar School uh, for Girls, and an external examiner to school governors, an executive mentor to a number of te head teachers and educational advisors for the school's regional commissioner. Helen is a patron of the Rwandan Sisterhood, working with survivors of genocide and deprived women in Kingali and supporting deprived women in Zimbabwe. She's a trustee of the National Holocaust Center and Museum. Uh, she's a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts and the Imperial War Museum and an advisor to the Holocaust Memorial Trust. And she's chaired the education work stream for the Prime Minister's Holocaust Commission. In 2020, she became a patron and active trustee of One Vision, a charity working with all religions to support the most vulnerable in Hertfordshire. And in 2012, Helen was made Dame Commander of the British Empire for services to national education and Holocaust education. Welcome, Dame Helen. It's a pleasure and I feel very humbled and honoured that you've uh, contacted me. So I'm, I'm in your hands now. Pardon? Uh, shall I share my screen? Uh, yes, if you if you wish. I'm I'm interested, and in, I know you grew up in South Africa. And mm -hmm. would you take me back, I suppose, to your early childhood in South Africa? And what we we'll, I'd like to talk to you about your interests there. What it was that got you interested in working with the Rwand Rwandan genocide and the and Holocaust education, and what brought you to the UK, mm -hmm. and all of that. So we'll start with your life in South Africa. Well, I'm ashamed to say that I actually had a charmed life. My father fled from Germany in the 30s, 1930s. My mother came from Belgium when she was 11. Um, nobody ever mentioned the Holocaust to me or family background. I knew nothing. Um, and actually, I'm going to share my screen because it'll just uh, make it a little bit more alive while I'm talking. Whatever makes you comfortable. Right. Well, well, that was me as a little girl. And actually, so I, cute. <laughs> um, we all had black maids, and they almost were our mothers. They brought us up. The awful thing is then they, they kind of stayed in little rooms at the back of the house, and they possibly only saw their family once a month, maybe, or less. Um, so, but I grew up not really understanding that, right through school, right through secondary school, nobody spoke about the apartheid system. Um, did you find it very hard um, or did it, 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 as you say, it, it never made an impact on you as a child because it was all you knew? Exactly. Yeah. When I went to university, um, obviously you start thinking, you start waking up. And these were the signs. We, we, we went on holiday to Durban, we went to the Cape, um, and there were certain parts of the beach, it was only for white people and certain parts for black people. Um, and I just, just started asking questions. When I spoke to my father, it linked, it, he just said, you know, you're lucky to be in this country, keep your head down. Yeah. And that made me start thinking more and more about my family. And they were all, you know, my grandparents, there were photos in the house. I knew the grandparents on these two sides. He was from Poland and she was a real German housefrau. She was wonderful. Yeah. Um, 
these I will I will tell you a little bit more. But nobody ever spoke about my background, my parents' background. Not even these are my pa- my mother's my, uh, parents. Parents, these yeah. My father's parents. Um, so we knew nothing. All I knew that my mother's brothers fought in the Belgium army in some war. Um, so I didn't really know much about anything. Um, and when I started asking particular questions about these two, my father said nothing. He wouldn't talk about it. Wow. But these were the pictures that, that actually haunted me and still haunt me. They were on my father's bedside table. Um, my father's this youngster here, and that's him there. That's my father's brother. And that's Helen, and my name's Helen. Yeah, you're called after her. Yeah, and that's my grandfather that you saw in the picture and the grandmother. So that, you know, South Africa and apartheid, I now teach about apartheid, only really impacted me on South Africa when I went on a march, anti-apartheid march, and my father was furious and forbade me ever do that sort Go of again. thing. Yeah. But wouldn't you, uh, sorry for interrupting, wouldn't you think that, uh, I suppose, was it a fear on your father's side to, to draw attention to you, to you as a family and, to, uh, and, and, and to, to, to fit in rather than to stand out because he had actually fleed um, uh, Nazi Europe, if you like, and... Um, was it that was it that that want, that that pushed him to try and I suppose fit in and 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 hide if you like and to um, I was showing you a photograph there one uh, earlier on of a, a girl Ilse Kuhn who was hidden in the Nazi in the in the Hitler Youth because she was half Jewish and at least in there no one would suspect that a Jewish child would be in the Hitler Youth. Was that maybe your parents thinking that, you know, we have to fit in, we don't want to stand out? I, I'm sure that's part of it. They wanted to be fully assimilated Jews. They went to a synagogue occasionally. Um, so there was fear, but I also have a feeling, although you know, we never spoke about it, there was guilt. Yeah. Because he knew what had happened to her and to many of the people in that picture. Um, and I knew that something had happened because I was named off, but he would never, ever speak about it. So assimilation, he wanted to really fit in. Grateful that him as a Jew was allowed into South Africa. Um, and just actually keeping his head down and keeping the peace and making it. Exactly, exactly, yeah. His family. Yeah, exactly. And... Um, and no, I'm, I, you know, because I suppose there was a parallel between how the, the South African black people were suffering under apartheid and what had happened um, to the Jewish people with the signs, no Jews allowed. Um, and, uh, and here in Ireland, it, when we were in, when the Irish went to England um, in the um, around 1845, after the famine, there were signs as well up that said no, no, no blacks, no dogs, no Irish. Yeah. So you know, I suppose uh, that our three peoples share that uh, per- that sense of persecution should probably there's bring. No, there's no hierarchy in one suffering more. Suffering is suffering. Suffering is suffering. Yeah. No. Um, so. Yeah, I always regretted that I couldn't actually speak to my father about it, but I did find out the whole story. And I mainly found out the story from my father's brother. Um, but I'll come back, come back to that a little bit later. So they're lovely photographs. Oh, that's a gorgeous photograph. That's my grandfather. I could just tell you a little bit about him um, on my father's side. Very well respected man in Germany, and the family went back in Germany into the 1700s. Um, a couple of years, just before COVID hit <laughs> all of us, um, I decided to go with my husband to the birthplace of my father, which is in a really beautiful town in Nordlingen in, in Bavaria. Honestly, it's yes, worth I was there. I was there. Oh, and my, I was just walking down 
the usual, as I do, Judengasse, Jewish street, and I came across <laughs> this memorial. And I looked across at the red building there, and there was a sign saying a Jewish home. But then I saw behind the memorial the signpost saying Zelich Man Jakob, my father's, my grandfather, born in 1875, died in 1942. He was shipped out to this open ghetto in yes. Piazzi, just outside Belgens. Wow. And the likelihood is um, he died in Belgens. He was 60 plus, and he would have been deemed to be a useless mouth, not worth living. Um, and so this is Piaski. This was the open ghetto. And this is me visiting Belgians to, to light a memorial candle for my, my grandfather. So I started really then researching this from about, um, I'd say, 1970, because I then I, I, I had done a, a degree in languages. Yes, and, I was you know, going to ask you how many languages do you speak because I'm calculating French. I know you, you spoke. French and German is what I grew up with. You probably English. have spoken Afrikaans as well, would you? Uh, Afrikaans was compulsory at school. Yeah. I now use Afrikaans when I don't want my children to understand. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then, of course, Hebrew. Of um, course, yeah. And I've tried Polish, but my, I've been to Poland so many times, I can't. It's too what about German? I speak German. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I was working out. I was working out. But Belzec was a very notorious camp. Do you no. know? What I mean, it was. Uh, it was just. Do you know what struck me was the amount of camps. One hears about Auschwitz and Meidenek and Belzec and um, Dachau and uh, all of these places. But there was all these smaller camps. There were hundreds of camps. Mm. Absolutely. All, all over. And I interviewed a man a while back and he was in 12. He's the only person alive to have been in 12 camps. He's 99 and he still he still drives a car, got his license uh, renewed a week before I interviewed him. And he wears no glasses and he's just extraordinary. But he survived 12 camps. What a wonderful. I mean, he must have a fantastic stamina. Anyway, oh. this this is what's left of my grandfather, um, a little stumbling stone outside the house um, where he was. So I'll carry on there. I had the joy, I know it was a very sad joy of going and sitting next to that and putting their photographs outside their house. And what, why I really love this is there's my father now as a, a man, man. And there's Helen, the one I was named after and her, his brother. And my granny, this one, died, thank goodness, <clears throat> um, of cancer. But the saddest thing is that my grandfather waited. He wouldn't leave her. And that's why he was trapped and sent away. God, Lord, good Lord. Do you know, I'm looking at those little plaques with your, your grandfather, uh, Jakob Seligman. <laughs> and I was watching a documentary, Who Do You Think You Are, with... Um, uh, uh, I can't, I'm, I'll think of his name in a minute, uh, Stephen Fry. Oh, and, yeah. and outside his grand, his great grandmother or his grandparents' door um, in, uh, in Germany, there was somebody, uh, uh, or no, in Poland, a Polish woman put plaques to every one of the Jews that were living in that apartment block who died in the Holocaust. She just dedicated herself to putting little plaques there. And I thought it was a lovely idea. It's a lovely I, memorial. I think this is a marvelous idea as well. The thing, <clears throat> some people can walk on them because you're supposed to stumble, but other people step over them. It's different reactions. Um, I'm like, Go well, on with stumbling this. is almost poignant, really, because when you stumble over something, you stumble into it as well. And you stumble into the reality of maybe asking the question, what, what's that about? And then that brings more questions along the line. And then you wonder about each, each of those stones was a person with dreams, ambitions. And when you, that, wipe, you wipe out that generation, there are no children to follow them. So it's, you know, the, the, the massive void and loss. 
So and, just, and the yeah, generations of victims that are made from one victim. I mean, it's just, you know, you think it's only one person, but, you know, if they manage to survive, the effect it can have on them and uh, the relation, the, the trauma that in many cases that they can't relate to their own children. So that's another generation that's affected by the previous generation's suffering. You were gorgeous. This is not me. Is that not you? No. And this is, the bottom picture is Helen. Yeah. That was her German stamped passport. Stamped, yeah. This was her son, Peter. Oh. That's Peter as well. Now, remember that one. Oh, he's adorable. They fled to Amsterdam like the Franks and they lived very near the Franks because of what was going on yeah um it's a complicated story so I'm really really making it simple um they had a daughter named Judith and they had to go into hiding because you know when the Nazis invaded so they went into hiding um but they gave Judith away to the to the Dutch underground because they had to they couldn't keep baby Peter quiet no, they couldn't keep Judith quiet. She was the baby. So the underground took her away to another province called Friesland, and she spent five years there. Um, that's her as oh. a little girl. She was brought up by this family, not Jewish. And the amazing thing is that she actually quite looks like the woman. And her... Oh, it happens. Yeah, the step sister looks like the dad. And they've met, remained very, very close all their lives. So she survived. Thank God. Did the rest survive? The, 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 the Christian family that reared them? Oh, yeah, they survived. Nobody in the village gave away the family. They knew about it. That's good. They were, they were betrayed. They were sent to Vesterborg and then to Sovivor, where they were guests on arrival. Sorbibor massacre, yeah. Yeah. Wow. What's left of them? That's if you've never been to Sobibor, there's a massive uh, mound of ashes. Um, so I lit a candle um, and you know went to their, their thing. This is interesting. Yeah, yuck. I yeah. my cousin Judith wouldn't go to the trial, so I went to the trial. And it was quite hor- horrifying. Obviously, I can imagine. I can they imagine. Found, they found him guilty. But um, he went to appeal and then he died. But the interesting thing is many people said to me, why am I bothered? He's an old man. And my answer to them was, I'm an educator. If children ask me why we punish a particular elderly criminal, I say, because he's done wrong. So my view is if you've done wrong, you must pay for it. So I went to the trial. There, is, there was no end to the suffering of his victims. The no. suffering of his victims was eternal. And the suffering of the next generation was it, it is eternal and the next generation. So why should somebody uh, like the Maniuk, uh get away with his crimes, even though he was in his 80s, wasn't he? He was in his 80s at the time. Yes, but he, was, he wasn't an ill man. No. Portrayed as that, but yeah, yeah. So I'll leave you to ask me more questions. It was. I, I'll tell you. It was. It must have been incredibly hard for you to have actually sat in the court uh, facing the maniac. It was awful, particularly that he had a solicitor. That if I, you know, I was listening to dual translation. If I closed my eyes, it sounded very similar to Hitler. He was banging and shouting and, um, you know, it was all part of his drama. And anyway, as long as he was, he was deemed to be guilty, and I was happy with that. It was, it, 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 it was a strange case that people, you know, would actually think that after all of those years, that somebody could just have lived out most of their lives in relative obscurity. And uh, people had to have known who he was. I agree with you. Yes. You know, he didn't get, he didn't live out um, most. Somebody had to have helped him to, to, to get the position that he was in and know who he was. And, you know, uh, tragically here in this country, there were so many Nazis 
protected yeah. um, after the war, and yet by, uh, 400 Jewish children were refused protection. Um, uh, and everything was delayed until they could actually, until they were sent back and most of them died. But people like uh, Otto Skarseni and Peter Menton and uh, 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 people like that, uh, they were all protected. I don't don't understand how victims could actually look somebody like him in the face and think... um, I don't know how they could think anything other than he needs to be punished. Absolutely. And, but, do you know, was his punishment wasn't satisfactory. Do you know, no, nothing will bring back six million Jews, five min, million Gentiles. And, um, yeah, uh, and yet they're still finding bodies. If you look at Father Patrick Debois, I mean, there's yeah, bodies being found left, right and centre in East uh, Eastern Europe in graves, mass graves, and they're the Holocaust by bullets. They're yeah. people who were just shot and be- and buried alive in most cases. So the six million Jews could be double if you actually start adding in. I agree with you, absolutely. But I don't think, you know, I'm not, don't want revenge or retribution. I just think yeah. justice, and he got justice, he was found guilty. Um, what... Uh, you were always conscious of your Jewishness, um, even when you were living in South Africa. So one would uh, expect that that was the uh, catalyst that drew you towards Holocaust education and trying to. It's different with me. I came through it a, a, a different route. Um, but um, how did you get interested in uh, the situation with African children and with African genocides? Because I know you have, you're just prolific in the amount of work that you do with all um, genocides. And I, I, I do a lot of work with, uh, say, the, um, the, 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 the Uyghur Muslims. I'm, I'm, I've been inter- interviewing uh, sur- survivors of, of the genocide of what's going on in China at the moment. And one of the whistleblowers from the United Nations, she was on my show to talk about what the UN are giving their names to China ahead of time. And subsequently, their families back in China are being tortured for them not to speak at the UN. So she, she's a law- she was a lawyer with the UN and she spoke to me about it. Um, as she's been fired since and threatened. Her life has been threatened. But I suppose you and I have that interest in humanity. Were you always a humanitarian at heart? Were you always conscious of other people's suffering? I can't say I was like that when I was growing up in South Africa. Mm. But um, when I started studying the Holocaust, I went, I did the Imperial War Museum Fellowship and I sat in a room with others. I was the only, I think there were two Jewish people, but I, I became very friendly with a woman, a Dutch woman whose father was a collaborator and a policeman, a a Met policeman, and I knew about the role of the police. And and we we studied together, and then I started teaching the subject. But years later, I became um, a trustee of of HET, the Holocaust Education Trust, but then also the National Holocaust Center and Museum that's up in Laxton, which is the most marvelous place. But I was visiting there one day, um, and I met just what I do for them now is I teach the kinder transport to primary schools across the country. Yes. You know, I was at the museum meeting some people and a most wonderfully looking gorgeous African woman was standing there. And I've always gravitated to people from Africa. It's my home. Yes, of course. Britain's my home and I love this country. But then we started talking. And to be honest, you might have think I'm asleep half the time. I hardly knew anything about Rwanda. I didn't even know where it was. Anyway, we we became very, very close. And then to to abbreviate the story a little, the Rwandan sisterhood was set up. Yes. Um, And I thought, well, I can't just, you know, become the patron and the trustee of it without actually knowing. So I've been to Rwanda seven times. And we set up this um, organization specifically to support the most deprived women 
mm. back of Kigali. So we now have a little school, still don't have running water. We're still, so we've got 75 children that started with 30. These are street children. We have a tiny unit for children who have the most level four malnutrition. Most of these children's families have suffered through the genocide. They've either got one grandmother or they're brought up by their grandparents. Um, and then we thought, well, we've got to make these women self-sufficient. Mm. I am not creative. <laughs> the only thing I can do is knit or crochet. And we <laughs> had this idea, we would teach them all to knit. The Lovely. Story, the third and fourth cohort now, I, I shipped out second-hand, well, I took out second-hand knitting machines. They're now in the school uniform and they don't need us anymore. They're self-sufficient. But then we, the, the major problem was a lot of these women still deliver children, um, their babies in the bush. Yeah. And, and many of them die. So we made a mama pack. I'm go, I've got a picture to show you. And if a woman either goes into hospital, she has to pay for everything, or she delivers in the, the bush or has a midwife out there, she now has absolutely everything she needs to, to deliver her own baby, to clean herself, to clean her own baby, and to wrap herself up. I'm going to show you. Do you know, you. Helen, or uh, Dame Helen, I should say, it, it's, um, it's stark that in 2022, people are still delivering babies in a bush. Yeah, yeah. Um, and in Rwanda, the situation has improved, but because of the genocide, it's a pretty young population. It's, I mean, people should visit, but it's interesting because at the same time I went to visit Bosnia and I looked at the murder of these men and boys just, just because they were Muslim. Yeah. So I, I decided, you know, I've got to do something. And I started with uh, mainly working in, in Rwanda but with Zimbabwe as well. And the interesting thing is not far away in where I live, I've got a number of Rwandan friends and a Zimbabwean friend. And to Zimbabwe, I'm able to ship now because we've got a shipper, but at the moment with COVID, we can't ship anything to Rwanda. It's all in my garage. I'd like to show you the mama pack. Let me share. No, I interviewed, I interviewed a girl a while back, Candace Mama is her name. And she's from South Africa and her father was, her father was killed by uh, Colonel de Kock during, yeah. during the, um, the apartheid regime. And she was only four at the time. And it, they set the father up and um, at a, a checkpoint, they shot him through the car and then set fire to it. And they, she saw photographs later of it uh, on the, the, her mother had it left on the table, a photograph in a book of, the the actual the, the police photograph and it it really almost killed her and a doctor told her her stomach ulcers were so bad she had to either forgive or she had or she would die the, she had to come to terms with it in some way so she forgave de cock she went to visit him in um, his south african prison God. and she and her mother sat opposite him and she sat then she moved and sat beside him and, she, and he burst out crying and whether that was um gen genuine or not um and she said i had to forgive him or it would have killed me and i find that very uh, you know it's commendable I, i'm not sure i could do not it. sure i could do it either you know i don't think i could tell do you it. this this is now my the CEO, that souvenir. And these are the mama packs we bring out. Um, you see here, it's wrapped up. It's lovely. It's absolutely everything, or oh, you can't see it. There's, you know, baby goes and all sorts of things. I won't give you the gory details, but you'd know. Um, and every woman we come up in the eighth month that come to us will get one of these. And we do have one or two midwives. We're now actually buying our own land, raising money, buying land, and going to build our own little unit. Um, here the women are, oh, why is this? here we are. Oh, wait a minute, let me go back one. Learning to knit. I did a lot of knitting. I used to knit a lot of stuff years ago. Uh, well, my mother was uh, a knitter. She knit for, for- I crochet. I'm not good at knitting. Yeah, I love knitting. <laughs> These ladies, we would, Teach them on a Tuesday. By Thursday, they were much better than us. 
So I can imagine, yeah. And here you can see them with their school uniform. This is in the last few years. This is the malnutrition unit. And here's our lovely little school. I love their uniforms. Marvelous. And from there, um, in the last, well, in the last year, besides one vision, this, I'll tell you about that. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask you what, to explain to me the concept of uh, one vision, the one vision project that you set up. It's set up by um, a Seventh-day Adventist couple initially, but now there's this, and his, so he's Seventh-day Adventist. The, his deputy is a Sikh. I'm one well, of trustees, I'm Jewish. Jewish. Um, and it's, it's so uplifting, you cannot believe it. These are the values, we bring people together but my role specifically is twofold. One, I work with the new Afghan refugees that have just, they've been in our country and they, they're about 500 families. So at the moment I visit them and I'm telling them, I'm trying to explain to them how our education system works. But for me, I've made really good friends and they are teaching me about their culture. At the moment, all I want to know is about their food <laughs> I can imagine. I have a friend, my best friend lived 30 odd years in Libya and the food is just fabulous. And wow. they're such welcome. I mean, her she's Irish, but her husband is is Libyan and the, they are such kind, you know, and, and the food is just to die for. But you couldn't eat it. You'd, you'd end up like a tank. Absolutely. Are they not? But no. I, so that's the one thing that we do, but I'll come back to the refugees, you know, if it's of interest. So what I do mainly now, two or three times a week, uh, when I'm not teaching, I help run a food hub. And we know about 200 families who are extremely deprived. They, they get support from the social services, but they need more. So on my three days, we deliver a hot meal that the Sikh temples make for us. Um, we have some cooking of our own, but they do that. And then we just live on donations and we pack a grocery bag and they get, a, they get food for every single day of the week. And we have drivers, all volunteers. They come in the drivers, they know the, the, the clients they're going to. So I do that two or three times a week as part of a team. With one and, and is the is it in any way funded by the government? Do you get no, no funding at all? The whole off? thing is donations. I'm going to stop sharing. The whole thing is donations. No, well, that's extraordinary. What worries me? Let me come back to the Afghans. Um, some of them have been in a hotel for six months because obviously housing and all that, but it's not good enough. It's really, really not good enough. I think our country, and in fact, any country that's bringing people who fled, allowing them into our country, we need to be much more open. Some of these people are very educated. I was talking to a dentist or whatever, and they have to retrain one. Yeah. Well, they cannot get into our universities. The universities tell us they, they're full. Well, you can't yeah. bring people into a country and treat them like that. Well, it's the same with my friend's daughter. When she came back, she went to England to live with her sister. Yeah. And she went to school there during the war in, in Libya. And, uh, and she did her final exams, but it wasn't accepted here in Ireland. So she went back for two years and did the leave insert, which is the equivalent of the A-levels. And she got... Nothing wrong with that system. Got the top marks in the class. And then she went on to university to do in, uh, computer engineering. And she's got the president's award every term for the last four years uh, for getting the top marks in, in, but she had to go through the two years here in Ireland. Um, and she was going to a school in Libya, which is the Irish curriculum. But she just, for the last year, she went to England and because of that, they, because it wasn't the Irish leaving cert. If she had done it in Libya, they would have recognised it, but not because it was the A-levels, yeah. do you know? And it was in a Muslim school. It wasn't, um, it wasn't the state, same curriculum. 
as we have here, I think, for getting into colleges. So it's, it's, it, it's just beggar's belief, but it's a great credit to her that she has oh, absolutely. come out the other side, do you know? And um, so um, what's the next uh, for you, Dame Helen? Well, it, it's more of what I'm doing because so much more need. I just want to spend my time with one vision, with my with the refugee friends, but I need, Holocaust education is is the most important thing to me. I've taught right through this week every single session. I was with um, students, primary school uh, children, and then I was asked, and this causes me some difficulty. Does Holocaust edu can Holocaust education cure anti-Semitism? And the answer to me is no, absolutely not. And I read an article by Jonathan Boyd. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. I have. Um, and the end of his article was, we need different strategies. We need Holocaust education. We need modern Holocaust education. We need to treasure our teachers because without them, but we need to treat it a little bit about COVID, he said. So you need prevention, you need punishment if you break the rules, and then you need strategies to help those people overcome it. Mm. And I thought that was very clever because um, UCL, University College, did um, a research project. I'm sure you know about it, but the students, they interviewed, I think, 9,000 students. The students could define homophobia, they could define all sorts of things, but they didn't know what anti-Semitism was. I know. We use anti-Jewish hatred or anti-Jewish racism. Um, I've spoken to many teachers. They, they would like to teach about the Holocaust and anti-Semitism, but they're frightened. One, two, they don't feel they've got the skills. And it's very difficult if say you've got a child that's fled from Rwanda or Bosnia or China, so it's fraught with difficulties, but I think we still need to tackle it. But, you know, I suppose it brings us up to the recent uh, situation with the Whoopi Goldberg we were talking before we started, you know, and I was saying, you know, the, what I think, you know, people need to do when somebody comes out with something that's completely and utterly incorrect like that is to challenge them. And I never saw once any of the members of uh, The View that she's on. It's ironic that it's called the view when nobody was allowed to have another view. She shut them down straight away. But, you know, it was almost like a, a, a gallery. They were all green with her. There was nobody there that was educated in, in, in the subject that they were talking about. And she spoke with such mm -hmm. utter clarity uh, about something she knew nothing about. And, you know, it was brought back to I suppose her own only understanding of race being black and white, but you know she she forgets as well that, or she probably uh, doesn't care that you know being Jewish isn't all about being say white. There's lots mm -hmm. of Ethiopian Jews. There's a, 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 in the same way as being Muslim isn't always Eastern or. Um, uh, North African, it can you can be a white person and you and you can come from Ireland and you can be a Muslim. You could be a Muslim convert or you could have Muslim parents. Um, you're absolutely right. She's totally and utterly ignorant. Totally and utterly ignorant. All she is is a, a television presenter and a bit of a singer. She sings quite nicely. She was an actress. Or an actress, but um, she is so ignorant. That's not my, my first thing. The, the second thing is to, to say it's about two white groups or whatever. I mean, it's laughable, but I have to say, or and not but, there are other people who feel one form of racism is more important or more harmful exactly. than the other. Yeah. I have a, a serious issue with people, even the educated people, who think that their suffering, their racism, you know, a black person that's suffering racism is of equal horror to me to a Jewish person accepting uh, suffering racism. 
there is no difference for me and it all needs to be dealt with do you think they were right to um to because there's different views i've spoken to some um jewish people who feel that uh, she should have been challenged and that it should have uh, encouraged a debate about the importance of education in in schools and that you're not going to you're not going to uh, challenge if you like anti-semitism by shoving it under the carpet and and hide and and getting rid of the person for two weeks she's on a holiday she's going to get paid uh for those two weeks she, it, my view she should have been probably fired um because they fired people for less um, I, you. I certainly don't think she's got her holidays for two weeks to go away and, you see for me if you're going to have somebody who's going to influence people adults of them you can get into conspiracies you can get into uh holocaust denial or belittle or fatigue but an, a person in with that responsibility has got to be educated and if they're allowed to make stupid ignorant statements they should lose their job i know i'm black and white with that no but 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 dame helen she didn't she, she came out with an uh, well a half baked apology about it and suddenly within uh what 24 hours she was suddenly one repentant, but two um, acceptant that her idea or that her view was completely wrong and that the Jewish people were, um, I mean, my goodness, it was the definition of racism, especially with the, the Nuremberg laws, the Nuremberg race laws that defined people by the very fact if they had one member of their family, one grandparent that was Jewish, they were Michelin second degrees. Um, you, you know, you had Sister Edith Stein, who converted to Catholicism, became a nun, um, was years a nun and died in Auschwitz, not because she was a Catholic or not because she was a Jew, but because because they deemed she was racially impure because she had she was born um into a Jewish family, irrespective of whether she converted to Catholicism and became a nun, it was all about race and their idea that the Jewish race was sub a sub race and vermin and needed to be eradicated, which is why that phrase comes in um, exterminating the Jews and not killing the Jews because they weren't deemed to be human. And it was a it was an absolute race crime. But for Whoopi Goldberg and any of these characters, just to say, I'm sorry, it's, it's, you know, it's like, I don't know if you've ever, the, it's gossip, but when I teach about, you know, don't talk badly about others, I use a story, it just, this, the end of the story is that the, the, the person just shakes a cushion full of feathers and those feathers just go. And yeah. you can never get those feathers back. So you can just say, so oh, I'm so sorry, I said bad things. It's meaningless. It's gone out into action. Into it's education, at, but turned into action. And that's one of the reasons why I continue to, to teach about the Holocaust. But it's not just the facts. It's lessons from the Holocaust. It's protecting our democracy. You know, we're all living in a, whether you think it's a good democracy or bad democracy, we still have a choice. We can believe anything we want. We can have any religion. We've got to protect these things. And if these frontline actors, famous people are so ignorant, then they should take a step back. But right. I think I, I said that in a post on Facebook, you know, when they go to the extreme of hiring people for these talk shows purely because of their fame and their celebrity status and give them a platform to speak about that which they know nothing about, or uh, and you're giving them a platform to people who actually celebrate them and think they're wonderful. I go back to that day when she said that, and Joy, um, uh, the other host uh, or the other uh, panelist, and all of the other panelists that were on the, the just agreed with her. Yeah. One because they probably hadn't a clue; they they didn't know. The, the reality, but they they still went along with her because she was she was um, saying something and and preventing them from having their opinion. But I would have had to be dragged kicking and screaming out of the room 
before I'd stay yeah. quiet. Well, I, I agree. Although, to be honest, I sometimes, and you won't believe it, I'm sometimes quite frightened because if I raise my head above the parapet sometimes, then they are, they, it becomes a personal thing against me as a Jew. Oh, you're only saying that because you're Jewish and all that. It, it's such terrible ignorance. But what worries me about the view that oh, Holocaust education will save the world is that I don't know about the Irish system, so I apologize, but in our system, um, Holocaust education is compulsory in year nine, so they're 14, but there's no curriculum, there's no textbook if you need a textbook, and there's no time allocation. So you think about one teacher will just do one page of the Holocaust, one pe teacher will spend two, three weeks on it, um, and then they may, never, they may never never do history again, and if they do do history, they may not do that period. So they may never ever really learn what can happen when you, you lose respect, you stereotype, propaganda, etc. And now with social media, fake news, propaganda, stereotyping is simple. You can get away with it. You can have a mass following. But as you know, I think if you want to think that, you must be trained to keep it to yourself but protect others. I, a little boy was asking me about, how do you know what someone's religion is? So I said, well, if you look at, and I said, you know, put up your hands if you're this religion. So there were three of us who were Jewish. I'm, you can see my color. Someone was blonde and so on. And there was a gingerhead girl. So I said, what religion are we? I guess, obviously not. And I, I just think we need to, get back to the view that we are all human. Some people say, oh, that's a different race. What, what race? We're only one human race. We're either human animals race. or we're of the human race. And therefore we have to treat all of us with dignity, generosity. That's why the Holocaust was so insidious because it did define people into races. Well, and that's it's such, it's pseudo rubbish because a race it's only one race. It's only one race. But, you know, I mean, it's it's funny you talk about Ireland. We do, do in the Leaving Certificate, we do um, uh, World War II study. You know, we learn about the ah. Holocaust. But to my knowledge, I'm the only um, uh, person in the country who has done literature on childhood under Nazism or even focused on childhood under Nazism. So it's not, you know, it's certainly not compulsory in schools. But I'm very happy to say I was I was lecturing for a good while in a Catholic college here in Limerick. Uh, well, uh, Catholic Ethos College, uh, Mary Immaculate. And they're, it's a college for to train teachers to be or to ch train students to be teachers, primary Wonderful. and secondary school. And so I was teaching uh, world religions and Holocaust education. And from that, I'm very pleased that a neighbor of mine, her daughter was in the class and she did her final year project on the Holocaust. And the, uh, during the week, my other neighbor, who would be a relative of this girl, um, decided that she had she had done her project, her final year project on the Holocaust. And uh, she she uh, she did it. She was studying for tourism and she actually took the dark tourism, uh, looking at how people actually go to um, places like Auschwitz and they turn it, you know, some people will turn it into a, a, a tourism site and the, you have all the, the um, how, how um, moral is it when you have shops selling, trying to encourage people in instead of treating the place like a, a monument and like to well, the you dead know, and you're people I photographing. I take many adult groups to Poland, many, um, and I run the, the group. I take them to Poland, to Amsterdam and to Berlin, although I'm now going to take a group to Prague in, in November. But my, for example, the group I'm taking to Amsterdam, uh, I will just advertise it by word of mouth. People join me. And what we do for the first few days is we study the Jewish life life in that city beforehand and then we follow a particular family and so on and so when we go to to poland like, and krakow the first few days in krakow 
when we visit all the many synagogues and the factories that where the Jewish people, it's vibrant. And Auschwitz is a, is a cemetery. And we will go to the cemetery with that in mind. Yes. Auschwitz one is just a museum. Fine. But Birkenau, we go as a cemetery. When I take people to Mandanek, it's a cemetery. Absolutely. What we treat. But bearing them out, when I take students, you've got to, you know, I'm not there to create crying and emotion. I'm teaching them <clears throat> the facts and I'm focusing on one family. But if they want to take photos, it's a kind of a protection. I agree, yeah. And I understand that totally. So, it is. But I think it visiting is. authentic sites is important. It is, but also teaching them, uh, teaching it uh, with reverence, because I did see some photographs not so long ago um, on Holocaust uh, Facebook pages, uh, Holocaust remembrance pages, and it was, they were outrageous. People were talking about them, where uh, people were doing handstands and they were posing yeah. in, um, in uh, against monuments and that. And to be honest with you, they should be just, they should be banned for life. From places like that, because a, a site like that is, is a, a place of reverence. And yes, of course, people want to take photographs because they want to bring back um, a, a moment or a, um, something that reminds them of the place so that they can actually um, take it in in their own space without yeah. anyone watching them and seeing their reactions. Do you know? Um, I've never been to any of the sites because I'm afraid to go on my own. I'm um, come with me on one of my trips. When I go to Poland next, I'll let you know. Oh, please do. Please uh, do. I, I, I can't get anyone to come with me because they say, oh, I, you know, you'll only start crying and I'll, I'll be... It's okay. I, I'll People be just... All sorts of reactions when they go and every reaction is fine. Or yeah, I'll, I'm, I'll be definitely on the Dame Helen uh, uh, train to... to uh, to Poland um, to, to um, yeah, it's, it'd be great to have somebody to go with that actually one understands it and two, and people that are all in the same, uh, I suppose, wavelength that don't want to be going off shopping to or going off to other sites that are there focused on, on, mm -hmm. on uh, studying and, and, and seeing Auschwitz. I have many fr uh, friends who have been there and they said it has utterly changed them since mm -hmm. they came. It does change. It does change. I mean, if if Madanik was easier to get to, I would go there because it's it's got, if you like, the same as Auschwitz, but it's even more horrifying because right Auschwitz, uh, it's a ring like that. Yeah. And on one wall here, you've got a huge apartment building, so everything was watched, and it's right. You know, it's almost just on the outskirts of a major city. So. So like nobody, there is nobody will tell me that they never knew what was going on. You don't smell those, the, the, the smell of blood or the scent of blood. And, uh, and you don't see people being uh, moved about and marched on death marches. And you don't witness those things or, or those things don't happen with six million people just okay. vanishing and nobody know anything about it. Well, I agree with that, but I, what worries me a little bit about some of the tours that I've seen is that the a guide, not the Auschwitz guides are brilliant now, they're all retrained, they're excellent, but some guides, I think part of what they want to do is to elicit an emotion, and that's actually not a guide's job. The no. guide is to give them the facts, to discuss, if, you know, if the students or an adult has a question, I'm not really a historian, but I studied the period. I will talk with them, but not talk at them or just uh, yeah. them to, to react in a particular way. Mm. Um, and I think it just, you know, as this becomes more history or into history, we need to think how we then go to authentic sites, what we can if you like, learn so that we, I'm just never again, I never say, because it's just ever again, ever again. It's a, yeah, it's just, it, 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 
because it is going to happen again. But, you know, I mean, sadly, it's happening all the time in lesser scales, probably, but it's happening. Uh, but uh, and others are a different other. Um, and, you know, it's, you know, I always said it, you know, as, as long as people look at somebody else and say, oh, it's not happening to me, I'm all right, keep my head down, do nothing, say nothing, be quiet, just get on with my work. Um, as long as it's happening, then it's the Martin Nemo quote again, oh, first they came to the communists and I didn't speak out because I wasn't a communist. Yeah. Do you know, until eventually they came for me and there was no one left to speak for me. And it's just, it, it's so true in all aspects of life, whether it's bullying, if you see someone being bullied in the classroom or a child being bullied because of the color of their skin or, the, or this, their weight or the fact that they yeah. have got the proper clothes. You, you know, you might be the cool child today, but tomorrow there you might need somebody else to stand up for you and... You can't really ask people to stand up for you if you've stood back for so long watching others suffer. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Well, Dame Helen, it's been absolutely extraordinary. Just, one thing you wanted me to show you. I, uh, Let me show you. Oh, gosh almighty. How could we have forgotten? Oh, I, it was in my head. I, 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 I really head. do want to see... Uh, see See your, your award, so honour. It's massive. This is what you get. And I didn't cut those off, you're Spring. right. <laughs> the spring is still there. It's really, really big. And that goes on the top. I'll have to stand up a little bit here. But then underneath it, you get this beautiful... You love that more, don't you? Because I, do, I like shiny things. But I thought, you know... Someone said, so did this make a difference to you? It made a massive difference to me. Firstly, I got a total shock, but that's irrelevant. When I came back from the palace and I was privileged enough to have the queen and she knew everything about me, um, I went through kind of a, a meltdown because I thought I've been given this honor, this, honor, this award, and it's driven me to do even more than I was going to do beforehand. Because I think if you yeah, get, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can sit back and say, okay, I've done it, finished. No. But no, I'm told my, my life now is like a candle. And when I'm going to take my last breath, it has to just be a melted bit at the bottom so that I know I deserve that. Yeah. That's just what I want. Yeah, it's, it's almost like the onus is on you to live up to the, uh, to, to, to the, the honor that they uh, and the respect that they had for you. But um, I mean, your work has spoken for itself, Dame Helen. What was it like when you found out that you were being made a uh, Dame Commander of the British it. Empire? I got a letter, and obviously, my PA, who was the most wonderful, wonderful woman. That sounds awfully posh. Well, I, I long for the day I'll have a PA. <laughs> well, me too. And I'll tell you, the day I left the school and I didn't have her anymore. I really struggled. She's wonderful. Anyway, she brought the letter in and I said to her, Sue, it's not true. I've always been a joker and I've got friends that joke with me all the time. So I said, oh, it's probably the same person that made me think I was going on jury service. <laughs> she kept on looking and she said, Helen, are you crazy? Look, there's a proper stamp there. Anyway, you weren't allowed to tell anybody. Not but even she, my knew, mom. My she, mom knew, was she knew. But I did tell my husband, then anyway, we wait and we wait. And then I was told to go to this posh event with the Lord High, the High Sheriff of whatever, I don't know. I'm not hierarchical at all. Anyway, she brought me in and all these people were there. And she said to me, you know, this is going to happen in February. You're not allowed to tell anybody until it's published in the paper. So I said, are you absolutely sure? I'm Helen Hyde. I'm a South African Jewish lady and I'm a teacher. <laughs> she just laughed at me. And then the day arrived. And honestly, I had my own parking space at the front of Buckingham Palace. Oh, stop, I can't. I'd love that. No, that, that, would, that would really be me. <laughs> See myself wonderful. having my own space at the front of Buckingham Palace. 
<laughs> I took photographs the day I got my my own space at the front of Mary Immaculate College <laughs> for my first class. And my name was on it, Dr. Mary Honan. And I actually took a photograph and put it up on Facebook. I was so excited. I, I was it. beside myself. I beside it. It. Yeah, no, it, it was just the... It's one of those events that you never forget, never. And when I got, um, I was awarded a doctorate at St. Albans Abbey. Oh, that place, it's like- Spectacular. Jewel. And all these teachers, young trainee teachers were sitting in front of me. I thought, this is God's gift to me, you know? It's just wonderful. So, but getting something from the queen, what could mm -hmm. be better? You must have been towering over her because she's only about my height. Yeah, but she was on a step. <laughs> she was, <laughs> was on a step to make herself no, look. She was, you had to do this special walk to her and curtsy and all that. But then she was on, on like a little stage above me. And you know, she shook my hand without gloves. She's an extra, you know, whatever people's, you know, opinions. I mean, there's various opinions that, you know, I'm a British subject as well, but she, she's an, been an extraordinary woman who hasn't, in my view, she hasn't put a foot wrong in her 70 years on the throne. And I mean, who would have thought that somebody could, and a woman in her 90s to be still working? It's just extraordinary, Dame Helen. She's, a, she's an example to us all, you know. She's wonderful. And when she came to Ireland, she, she, uh, she, she became, you know, she became very popular for the fact that she sat beside, stood beside the president and she said, um, uh, which is um, uh, president and uh, people, uh, uh, she, what is, she said, which is president and friends. And so she said, so she she thanked the president and the people there, Ukdaron Agzakorja. And it was so popular here in Ireland that somebody uh, recorded it. And at the railway stations every hour, uh, oh. <laughs> they'd hear the Queen saying, Ukdaron Agzakorja. Uh, yeah. I love that. It was lovely. Ukdaron Agzakorja, president and friends. That's that's all it means. And uh, but it was just the fact that she made that effort to to speak some bit of uh, some bit of Ir of the Irish language, given the that language is too difficult for me. Pardon? I can't do it. It's too hard, that language for me. But it shouldn't be because it's quite guttural, almost like um, uh, the German language. There's yeah. there's a. There's a and the Welsh would be different, but the Scottish and the Irish language, and even the German, the you know the they're all guttural. So you speak German, so you should have no problem. That's your next task now, Dame Helen, is to learn Irish. <laughs> <laughs> when we go off to Poland, uh, you'll have to have your Irish. <laughs> I don't speak Irish either fluently. All oh, right. Okay. <laughs> No, but um, I wish I did. It's a beautiful language. But Dame Helen, thank you so very much for being so lovely and coming on the show. Eventually, I got you. Eventually. Thank Eventually. You privilege. And uh, it's been an absolute honour. And please keep in touch with me and Absolutely. let me know when uh, the uh, trip to Poland is coming up. Thank you so much. It's been lovely to meet you and I will definitely read your book. It sounds astounding. Oh, by the way, I have copies of it here, so um, I can send you send you a copy if you want and I'll sign it. And if you I just... I would be honoured and I would... You send really me your, if you send me your um, your address, uh, or I'll, I'll post it to you. I would really love it and I will give it publicity down here. Oh, please do. Please do. <laughs> Thank you so much. Tinder Alesh on Clore. That's the end of the show. Until Thank the you. next time, Lacoon of Day. But while I'm to Galer Chiacona, Sonus Agus Grau, I wish you peace, happiness, and love. Agus Gadeshiv Slon. Shalom. Shalom. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay.